Good morning, everybody. Today there was a Code Forces round. Uh, it was Code Forces round 677. It was a Div 3 round. I wasn't able to participate because I had some work related stuff come up that I had to take care of. Um, so you won't see my screencast, but I did just read through all of the problems and I thought I'd go through solutions uh, before the contest ends. So um, if you're looking for those, you should have access to them. Um, all right, so let's talk about the problems. Um, the first problem is problem A, as usual. And this is a pretty simple problem. I won't actually go through implementation details of it, but basically you have um, like a bunch of apartments and a boring number is just a sequence of a bunch of copies of the same digit. So 11 is a boring number because it's a bunch of ones, 777 is also a boring number, etc. And you wanna know if you press first like one and then one one and then one 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 and then finally up to four ones, and you keep pressing um, all of the ones and then you press all of the twos in increasing order and all of the threes, you wanna know how many digits you'll press total before you dial a certain number. So in this example, they give you um, 22 and 22 works just fine. But for, in order to do that, first you type one and then you type one, 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 one. Uh, then you type two and then two, two. So since there aren't that many of these numbers total, we can just simulate it. So we can do one for loop for which digit from one up to nine. And then we can do another for loop for how many times it occurs. And then the runtime there will be like order 36. Each time uh, we just check, okay, is this the string we're trying to form? Um, if it is, we're good. If it's not, then we add, well, if it is, then we, we break out and print the answer. Um, but regardless, we add however many times this digit occurs to the total number of button presses we've made. So yeah, that was a, a pretty simple problem, I think, and easy enough for problem A. And a problem B, yet another bookshelf. So in this problem, you have a bunch of books in a bookshelf. On a given move, what you can do is for a cost of one, you can pick a continuous segment of books, and then you can move it one to the left or one to the right. Your goal is to make all of your books lined up in a row. So if your bookshelf looks something like this, then on your first step, you could maybe take this book and move it over one. So now you have one, one, zero, 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 and then this part stays the same. Then you might take this bookshelf and move it over one. Now you have zero, one, zero, one, or yeah. And then uh, finally you might take these two and move them over one. So you might have zero, one, 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 followed by four zeros. So now you've accomplished your goal and you want to do this in the fewest possible number of moves total. Um, how do you actually solve this problem? Well, it turns out that during each of these steps, we can notice that we effectively remove one of the zeros that is between the leftmost one and the rightmost one. So all we need to do here is count how many of these zeros exist and that's the total number of turns. So we find the position of the first one and the position of the last one and now iterate through this range, count how many zeros there are, that's gonna be our answer. Um, you can prove this by saying, what we'll do every turn is we'll move the leftmost block of ones over by one, and that's one way of constructing the answer. So that's how you can do it in the fewest number of moves. Um, the proof that it takes always at least that many moves would be something like, well, you can't get rid of multiple zeros per turn, no matter what you do. So those are an upper and lower bound that are the same, and that's kind of a proof that it's the best. All right, on to problem C, dominant piranha. Um, so in this, or in this problem, you're given some array, which is the sizes of a bunch of piranhas. And yeah, so okay, so then um, what you can do is if you're a piranha and you're bigger than one of your neighbors, you can eat your neighbor and then um, increase your size by one. In this first example, they say one, one like set of piranhas could be five, three, four, four, five. This four piranha could first eat this four, then it would become a five, and then you'd have a five here, a three, um, and then a five, or sorry, it can't, it can't eat this four because it's the same as the four, but it could eat the three to its left. So now you have five, five, four, five. 
Then you could eat the four and get five, six, five. Then you could eat this five and you could be five, uh, seven. Now you could eat just this five and just become one prana of size eight. So the question is, can you find one dominant prana that can eat every other prana if all of the other pranas just don't do anything? Or determine that there are no dominant pranas? Um, should be pretty clear that if you're the biggest in the tank or you tie for the biggest, then uh, you can be a winner. So I guess there's one case in which that's not true, but it should be, I guess, pretty easy otherwise. So let's consider the biggest piranha. If you're the only one who's the biggest, right? Let's say you're like a, a seven and everything else is like a six or smaller, then you can just eat everyone before you and then eat everyone after you. And that's it. Um, okay, so basically we're looking for something that's the biggest. That should be pretty easy. Now, beyond that, there are some other cases where it's not necessarily true that anyone who's the biggest can be dominant. So if you consider something like this, in this example, you have this biggest seven. Well, this seven could eat all the sixes and then it could eat all of these sevens, which would be fine. But this first seven isn't actually dominant. So what we can do here is first find the biggest, um, biggest number. And then we want to find if there's any index where this number occurs next to some other number that's different. If there is, then this is one dominant example. So here you have a seven and it's next to a six. Um, should be pretty clear that the only time you won't find one of these pairs is if the entire array is the same number, in which case no prana can eat any other prana. So uh, you're kind of just stuck. So yeah, so that's the solution. So basically find the biggest number in the array and then find um, if the array is all the same number. If it is, print negative one. If it's not, find some index where that biggest number is next to something that's different. All right, awesome. Uh, problem D, direct connections. So in this problem, you have a graph sort of thing. Um, it isn't actually a graph yet. At the moment, it's just a bunch of, a bunch of nodes of different colors. And you want to draw a bunch of edges so that no two nodes that were previously colored the same color will be directly connected by an edge. So let's look at this first example. We have five nodes. Um, the first and fourth one are both blue. The second and third one are both red. And then the fifth one is green. So this is what we're looking at here in this example. And one thing that you could do to connect them is you could add this edge here, because um, these two are different colors. You could add this edge here. Uh, you could add this edge here. And then you could add this edge here. So here we've connected them all in a path, but we don't have to do that. We could do something like this as well. That would work. Um, yeah, so that's fine. In this example, they connect one to three. So I'll just do the example that they choose. They connect one to three, three to five, five to four, and one to two. So it looks like this. So yeah, this works. Um, and I guess there might be several ways of solving the problem, but I'm going to come up with the way that I think is the easiest. So the first is kind of similar to the last problem. If everything is the same color, then there's clearly no solution because we can't even add a single edge to the graph. The only exception is if n equals one, which I'm not sure if that's allowed or not. It's not, yeah. So if everything is the same color, we can't even add one edge, which means it's impossible. So we'll special case that. In that case, we print negative one. In all other cases, what that means is that we have at least two different colors. So we have something like this. Well, let's find the first two nodes that are different colors. It should be pretty easy to do. We have the first node. We just find the first node that's a different color from that. So we do that in linear time. We'll add an edge between these two. Now, for every other node, we know these two are different, right? For every other node in the graph, let's consider this three. Either the three is the same color as the one, or it isn't. If the three is the same color as the one, that means it's a different color from the two because the one and the two are different colors. But if the three is a different color from the one, then we'll add an edge here. 
So we can build our graph like this by just repeatedly connecting everything to either the one or the two. And that will connect our graph uh, using n minus one roads. It'll make everything mutually connected. And um, I guess it'll satisfy the constraint. So yeah, I think that's, um, that's what we're looking for. The fact that n is always small uh, makes it so that you can do other things too, probably. Like you can just add all edges possible and find the minimum spanning tree, um, or just any spanning tree, really. I think that would work as well. But I think this is probably the easiest way that I would be able to think of to implement it. Um, very good. So three more problems. Problem E is incredibly math heavy. You have n people. You want to split them up into two equal sized groups. And then you want to make like a round. Uh, so like you split them up into equal sized groups. Then each group has some ordering. And you want to like order these groups in some way. And then they'll each like be in a circle and then dance together. Um, the question is, how many ways are there to split it up into two groups, which are in two different circles? So uh, let's do an example, maybe. If you have four people, well, let's say if you have six people. So we need to pick two different groups. Let's say we split them up like this. There are a bunch of ways you could do it. In fact, there are six choose three ways to split them up. So that'll be important later. But then we have these two groups. Now it doesn't matter which half is um, is like the first circle, which half is the second circle. So there are six choose three ways, but we need to divide by two uh, to account for the fact that we'll double count which circle is which. Then after we do that, we have this one, three, two, and also we have four, five, six. Um, the direction of this circle, I'm pretty sure they said matters in a clarification request. But the, the starting point of the circle doesn't matter. So in this example, you have 1, 3, 2. So this is one possible starting group. And then here you might have uh, 6, 5, 4, like this. So this is one way of doing it. You have one circle, which is um, like this going circular this way, one, three, two, which is one, three, two is the same as two, one, three. These are the same circle. And then you have this other circle, which is like four, six, five, or six, five, four, or five, four, six. They're all basically the same thing. So now I guess the question is, we know how many ways there are to split it up. It's just six choose three um, divided by two for the two different groups. We'll double count which one is first. But then we also want to count how many ways are there to, once we've split it up, um, make this circle out of these people. Well, this is not too difficult to do. Basically, we can order these in any way. But then whichever position the smallest thing is in, we'll use that to define the start of the circle. So if we have three things here, there are three factorial ways of doing that. But we want to divide by three. Um, because the one will force the one to be in the first position. So in this case, we have six choose three over two. Um, there are this many ways of doing that. But then for each group, so this is going to happen twice. Um, I'll just square it at the end. For each of these two groups, we have um, six over two factorial. Um, divided by 6 over 2. So in other words, this is really 6 over 2 minus 1 factorial. So let's do this on the sample just to make sure it's right. So we have this 8 here. Um, what this would be is it would be 8 choose 4, which is 70. So this would be 70 uh, divided by 2, which is 35. And then we also want to multiply this by 3 factorial, um, which is, yeah, like 4 factorial divided by 4, which is 3 factorial, uh, 3 factorial squared. So 
that would be uh, 36. So that's 35 times um, 36, I think, which is 1260, which I'm pretty sure is the correct, correct answer. Yeah, 1260. Um, you might have to special case the two example because like the rotations is slightly different, I guess. Um, like the the order doesn't matter. Yeah, okay. I won't I won't go into too many details there, but I think that's fine. All right, very good. That's problem E. Uh, problem F: zero remainder sum. I thought this problem was pretty boring because um, it was just very classic and kind of uninteresting. But I guess if you're learning dynamic programming, then I guess this is a fine introductory, introductory problem. So you have a matrix of size n by m, and you want to pick up to half of the elements in each row, but not more than half. And you want to make sure in each row, or sorry, in total, the sum of all of the elements you pick is at most k. And also, after doing that, the sum of all of the elements you pick is as large as possible. Um, yeah, OK. So you're allowed to choose zero elements, which will be required if the size of each row is 1. Um, but otherwise, maybe you want to, maybe you don't. And you want to find the maximum possible sum. OK, so how do you do this? Well, we can like consider each row separately. So we're going to do two different DPs, I guess. The first one is we'll do like some dp1, and the state here will be which row we're at. So for a given row, we're going to like do this dp separately. So we'll think about like ignore the row part for now. We're just going to do it for every different row. Then we'll consider which like column in this row are we at, and then what is our current sum, or like what what sum do we want this suffix to reach? Um, and finally, how many things can we pick? Then this will return the maximum uh, sum. So in other words, if you have a bunch of elements in this row, let's say we're going to look at these four elements here. We can pick um, at most three of them. So what are our choices for this position here? Well, we can either not pick this position. In this case, we'll go to DP with the same row, the same column, the same suffix sum, and the same number of things we can pick. The other choice is we can choose this, in which case we still go to the same row. Oh, sorry, we go to the column plus one, next column. Uh, we still have the same same row, still go to the next column. In this case, it'll be suffix sum um, minus like a at i minus this this value here. And we also want to take this under mod. So like plus k and then mod k. And we can pick one fewer thing now after we've taken this. So we can say for a given row, if in this row we want to our mod to change by a certain amount, what is the biggest total we can get in this row legally for that to happen? So that's what this DP does. Then once we've done this DP, we can do another DP. So this will be DP2. And this will store which column are we at. Um, or sorry, which, which row are we on? And what is our current sum? The idea here is that we can like process each row one at a time. So for a given row, there are up to k choices. So you can say, okay, do I want to take the first, or do I want a total of one to be added for this row, a total of two, three, four, or five, etc. Um, and then for each of those choices, you can say, okay, well, if I take, a, if my sum increases by five at this row, then how much, or if my, this, is, this isn't really sum, I guess this is your, your sum mod k. If my sum increases by 5, then what's the biggest it could possibly be um, on this row? So yeah, that's the idea. And you can do that for each row. You have n different choices to consider going to the next row. And then at the end, you want your sum to be 0. So yeah, so this is equal to 
uh, the max sum again. I think that's self-explanatory enough. If you want, I'm pretty sure you can also combine these two DPs into just one, but I don't think that's necessary, and I think it makes it a little bit more, um, you have to be more careful. Um, this is just do normal DP stuff that hopefully you've done several times before, and the only difference here is in this case, you're just doing it twice. All right, ooh, contest is over, awesome. So last thing is problem G, reducing delivery cost. In this, exam or in this problem, you have a graph with some constraints. So the first constraint is there are at most a thousand nodes in the graph. There are also at most a thousand edges. And you have like a bunch of, the edges are weighted, first of all, but you also have like a bunch of um, delivery paths that you're considering taking. So maybe the delivery paths look like, or maybe the graph looks like this. You also might have a delivery path, which is you have to go from this node here to this node here. You have to go from this node here to this node here maybe from this node here to this node here. So what's gonna happen is you'll have all of these, these paths that you have to go to, and the total cost you have to pay is the shortest path from like across each delivery path in the graph. So the path, the, like the amount you'll have to pay will be like this path here, um, plus the shortest path, shortest distance between these two nodes, plus the shortest distance between these two. And that's your, your final cost that you have to pay. Now, what you're allowed to do is for a single edge in the graph, you're allowed to set its value equal to zero. And you wanna know if you choose the best edge for that possible, what will the total cost you have to pay be? So it's possible we set this edge equal to zero. Um, maybe that's not a great edge, but I guess it works. And then maybe these are the, the paths we take. So we've just like, like it's possible that, it's possible the shortest path was initially this, but then when we set this to zero, the shortest path decreases. So it's possible we've decreased the cost a couple times. They don't all have to take this edge. Uh, maybe some of them do, maybe some of them don't. Maybe this path goes like this still, or sorry, this path goes like this, doesn't use this edge. Um, but yeah, we have lots of choices. So what we're gonna do here in order to solve the problem is we're gonna brute force which edge that we end up deleting. It's possible we delete any of them. Um, we will just try each of them. So now for each edge, we wanna know what if we delete this edge? What will our total cost be? Well, it turns out that that's actually not too bad to calculate um, because what we can do is before we do all of this, we're gonna do Dijkstra's we're going to run Dijkstra's algorithm, um, order n times, one from each node. So now, basically, we've run Floyd Warshall's, except we've done it in um, n squared times log n time, because we have only like a thousand edges, so it's pretty fast. So this is going to be our final runtime, but I guess plus like n times k, where n and m are both like. I call both of them n here because they're both a thousand. So yeah, that's that's what we're gonna do. Um, okay. So we know the shortest distance between any pair of nodes in the original graph. Now what we can do once we have that, we can say, let's consider breaking this edge. We're gonna iterate through all 1000 of these paths that we need to take and say, okay, if we're gonna take the shortest path between these two, either the shortest path between these two nodes, whatever it was, maybe it was something like this, either it doesn't change at all, and that's possible. If these two edges are both like one and this edge is like 50, then still taking this edge, even though it's now free, doesn't really help us. So what we can do here is just say, okay, um, we can just take whatever the shortest path was. Alternatively, if we've got some node here, we have this free edge that we just create or that we just made free. And we have something here. If we want to find the shortest path between these two nodes, it could be what it was before, but it could also be the shortest path from these two plus the shortest path from these two. And calculating this new shortest path, we can do in order one time by just saying, okay, what's this distance here? And also what's this distance? That will give us the answer. 
So yeah, so we'll try each edge. There are a thousand edges we could delete, and then for each one of those, we'll try all 1,000 possible um, new, new paths and see which one of them improve. And that's the idea. OK. So yeah, hopefully um, these solutions were helpful. Let me know if I misunderstood any of the problems. It's possible that I'm just like massively wrong for one of these because I didn't actually implement them. So it's possible I just totally misunderstood something. Um, but yeah, um, hopefully you enjoyed the contest. And hopefully if it was rated for you, your rating, rating went up. Um, oops. Uh, that's all from me. Hope you have a great day. Uh, goodbye.